I moved to Los Angeles at six years old, seven years old. I was actually born with a blood disease called neutropenia, which was an important part of my life growing up. I spent the first six years of my life in Children's Hospital. My memory of before I was six years old really is non-existent. It's kind of blacked it out. Moved to Los Angeles at uh, the age of almost seven. I got cured. I was lucky to be cured. It was not a curable disease. It was at that point, it was just something that uh, you got lucky. And I feel like I've had a little bit of a uh, leprechaun on my shoulder, you know, ever since then. Welcome to Diggs Influencer Podcast, the Titans of Real Estate the show that provides direct access to the real estate industry's top movers and shakers as they share invaluable insight on how to best navigate and succeed in any market. I'm your host, Warren Dow, founder and CEO of M3 Media and publisher of Diggs Magazine. In this episode, Mauricio Lumansky. Thank you to our show sponsor, Bo Concept. Today's guest defines what it is to be a true titan of real estate. He's the founder and CEO of the agency and has represented some of the world's most exclusive and distinguished properties, including the Playboy Mansion, the Walt Disney Estate, and many others, and is truly a household name among the movers and shakers in real estate. Please welcome to the show, Mauricio Umansky. Thank you, Warren. I'm good to be part of the show and... Looking forward to a really nice conversation with you. All right, let's do this. So before we begin, let me quickly give our audience some context around some of the amazing things that you've accomplished in this industry. Um, oh, please don't. <laughs> we have to. We have to. The world needs to know. Currently ranked number three in the entire country by transaction volume with $548 million transacted. That's according to 2018 Real Trends The Thousand. You've been ranked among the top 10 agents in the country for seven straight years per Real Trends again. You sold the most homes in the country priced above $20 million. You sold the first home in LA County over $100 million at Playboy Mansion. You launched the agency in 2011, which ranks among the Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing private companies in the country. The agency ranked fifth largest residential brokerage in LA County by sales volume with $6 billion in sales in 2018. For four consecutive years, Mauricio has been named one of the most influential people in L.A. by the L.A. Business Journal. Mauricio is also a proud member of the Young President's Organization, YPO, and is active in philanthropic work, including serving on the board of Give Back Homes, the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and the National Breast Cancer Association. Mauricio, congratulations on all of your hard-earned success. It's an honor to be with you today. Wow. Well, those are all amazing accolades. I can't believe you're actually talking about me, <laughs> but the, uh, thank you very much. And it is an honor to be here with you and look forward to hopefully giving some great insight in, to the, our audience listening here today. And let's have some fun. Absolutely. So let's start from the beginning. Let's, let's get back into who is Mauricio? Tell us your story. Oh, wow. Who is Mauricio? Well, I, uh, I think one of the most important things is that I'm a proud father and a proud husband. I think that's the foremost, most important thing. Uh, father of four daughters, and uh, they range from 11 to uh, 30, and uh, just an absolutely incredible thing. Really, everything I do is is all about you know them and balancing life so that I can spend time with them. Certainly, a really proud husband. My wife Kyle is an extraordinary woman, and uh, just super proud you know to be able to uh, say that I've been known her for 25, 26 years, and nearly married for 24 years. Uh, particularly in Los Angeles and Hollywood, I think that's an extraordinary feat. And I can tell you that we're still really happy and it's not anywhere near the end, but uh, hopefully uh, she'll watch she'll watch me die instead of uh, the other way around one day. <laughs> From a business perspective, I mean, I was born in Mexico City. I moved to Los Angeles at six years old, seven years old. I was actually born with a blood disease called neutropenia, which was an important part of my life growing up. Spent all my life at Children's Hospital, which is why I'm so into Children's Hospital or the first six years of my life in Children's Hospital. My memory of before I was six years old really is non-existent. It's kind of blacked it out. Moved to Los Angeles at uh, the age of almost seven and uh, grew up in L.A. I got cured. I was lucky to be cured. It was not a curable disease. It was at that point, it was just something that uh, you got lucky. And I feel like I've had a little bit of a uh, leprechaun on my shoulder, you know, 
ever since then, you know, kind of taking care of certain decisions. And, you know, I think it's also been kind of one of the reasons why i have uh, uh, so confident in terms of making decisions. I live by a uh, couple of important rules, a certainty versus doubt. And I never, uh, any decision I make, I always have certainty making those decisions. I never doubt myself. I may or may not be right. And I may or may not make a mistake, but at least having certainty in those decisions is uh, uh, one of the, you know, the unique features that I think has always gotten me through the world. Went to high school here, uh, avid golfer, avid skier, really loved sports all of my life. Really, I think that competitiveness is what's gotten me through through life, and that is what is my primary uh, reason why I continue to uh, to try to strive and be successful and move forward. It is the competitive nature that kind of keeps me going every single day. I uh, started working for my father back in the 22 years old, and uh, then finally got into real estate when I was 26 uh, years old in 1996, which is when my first daughter was born. My, well, my first daughter, my, my oldest daughter is a stepdaughter, but I call her mine because I've raised her since she was five. And uh, so my first daughter, Alexia, was born in 1996, and that's approximately when I got into real estate. And then I uh, kept it going. And one of the you know promises that I made myself when I got into real estate is that I would never have a uh, worse year than the year before in terms of sales volume. And again, that was my competitive nature that caught me going. And uh, for about 24 years, I was able to keep that going until I started the agency. And then when I started the agency, I had one bad year because that's how I, you know, I had to start the agency and sell. So I wouldn't call it a bad year. I still made the top 10, but uh, certainly it was the first year I didn't uh, outperform the previous year. And then after that, I think I've outperformed the previous years ever since. So super proud of that and super proud of the agency and Really what the agency is, you know, and I'm most proud of is the family that we've created there, is the people. The agency could not be the agency without the extraordinary people that work at the agency because that's really what it's all about. So all I've done is really just compile a whole bunch of really extraordinary people and let them do their thing. And that's what, you know, the agency is and set out to define and redefine real estate. And here we are. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so let's go back. Let's go back to your life. That was a loaded Be- question, Warren. Yeah, I know. That was a good, that was a good, good answer. You hit, you hit a lot of questions within that one question. So, so are we done? We're done. All that's right. it. That's a wrap. Um, now, I want to go back. When you first started selling real estate, let's, get, let's talk more about before the agency, okay? Let's go back to that first year. Tell us about, like, why did you get started? Tell us about that first year. Well, I used to work with my father and selling textiles, and then he and I began a, a clothing company that uh, was called 90265, an amazing company that we uh, purchased and grew it. My father gave me all the support needed at that time, and I learned a lot of amazing you know, selling lessons from my father. You know, we, When you sell piece goods, which is basically textiles, for those of you who don't know, what you're doing is you're selling tremendous volume. And so you're se- you know you're selling multiple millions of yards on a yearly basis. And I used to leave and come back with a three hundred thousand yard order, and I would sell it for ninety seven cents a yard. And I was all happy and gung ho and dancing in my car and you know playing you know Highway to Heaven and just going hard. And I get back to the office and I tell my father, Hey, Dad, I got an order. And my dad, you know, would do the math and he goes, I need you to go get another cent and a half per yard. I'm like, a cent and a half? What are you talking about? He goes. Go multiply a cent and a half by five million yards, and you tell me how much money that is at the end of the year. And so uh, he really taught me how to uh, understand the value of the cent, yeah, mm-hmm. not the dollar. And I think that's kind of important for all my life because you know what that means is I, I also really understand the value of the second, not the minute, or not the hour, or not the day, but the value of the second. And uh, understanding the value of the cent is is as important from a financial perspective as, as understanding the value of a second from a time perspective. And um, we, we did that. We grew the company. It was an amazing company. We grew it to $30 million of sales, but unfortunately, I really couldn't produce the goods. So to make a long story short, we had to basically close the company, sell the company. I had to go work for another big company. I was really not made out to working for other people. I was really meant to be an entrepreneur and work for myself. I did not like that experience at all. And so uh, my brother-in-law, uh, Rick Hilton, owned a company called Hilton and & Highland, and uh, he gave me an opportunity to start working for him and selling real estate. My wife convinced me. She and I both went to school and got our real estate licenses together. She never practiced, but she certainly helped me get through that and was a tremendous amount of support and all that stuff. Uh, I had been fired from my last job. I was not, a, like I said, I was not good at working. At that point, you know, we had kind of lost, you know, all our money kind of down and out. My wife really got me through that moment, and uh, she really was extraordinarily supportive. We had a kid already. So we had since two kids. We were living in a two-bedroom condo. And uh, 
she convinced me to go sell real estate and she was just always super supportive and super strong and just an amazing woman. And uh, my first sale was actually to her ex-husband and that was an extraordinary sale and he was super supportive. He's been a great friend since then and we have an amazing relationship. We can always talk about that later if you want. But uh, <laughs> that was my first sale and, and uh, the first year I made $180,000 and like I said, I promised myself that I would never have a, uh, a worse outperforming year than the first year and uh, I basically did that and I kept that promise through 24 years including through the recessions that uh, that we went through there and the recessions is when I was able to grow the business and actually outperform everybody else and really grew from being a top agent you know maybe 150 in the nation or 350 in the nation I have no idea what number it was to being number seven in the nation and that's when I made that big jump during that recession period and I think that was kind of a critical moment in my life in terms of, uh, you know, what, where we are now and what we're doing today. So great. And how long did you work for Hilton Highland? That was your first? So I worked for Hilton and Highland for, I guess, approximately 15 years, plus or minus. I never went anywhere else. That was the only thing I ever knew, I guess, from 96 or 97 through 2011. So, yeah, 14 years, plus or minus. So what do you, what's your biggest takeaway from that experience? What did you learn and glean from those years that gave you some insight before you started the agency? Like, what did, what did you take away that? I was a salesperson at that time. I was never really a, a getting into it. And I was just growing my own business. It was, you know, one of the things that I love about being a sales agent is that you really do control your own business. You know, you're in control of your, your marketing, your financials, your, you know, basically everything you do is, is so it's kind of a business within a business. Really, the brokerage house, you know, what they do at that point is they really just kind of hold that broker's license and give you, in theory, some support. Hilton Highland is a great company, uh, luxury, you know, brand, you know, just an amazing, you know, company. And I learned a lot, you know, in terms of being a luxury uh, agent. But again, you know, the reality is that what you do is you learn from your own experiences and being an agent, uh, you, you know, one of the beautiful things is that you really do control your own business, right? So, I think really, you know, where I really learned a lot was not necessarily from those days, but really from, you know, the clothing days and the uh, the time that my father and I grew that business and made all the mistakes that we made in, in, in production and different, you know, ways of and methodologies of operating and assemblages and assembly lines and et cetera, et cetera. And I think I take a lot more knowledge from those days than I do as being a, what I learned in, in, in those 15 years was, you know, the market you know, the real mm -hmm. estate, I learned knowledge. And I always tell all agents out there that what they need to know is they need to know they need to have a tremendous knowledge of the market. And they need to be the most knowledgeable person in the room at any given time, uh, regarding, you know, what the market's doing, yeah, and their totally inventory, agree. and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's go back to failure mistake, I'm always curious about, you know, it could be in real estate or what you're doing before, what was the biggest like mistake you made, or you can that or lesson learned kind of moment for you? Like, yeah, I don't know if it was one mistake that was that was done, but you know, certainly just you know, from our perspective was managing uh, the production. And you know, you, when you're producing, multi, you know, thirty million dollars worth of goods, you need to be able to produce quality goods in order to get them delivered. And uh, managing the business, and you know, the apparel business is an extraordinarily difficult business just because there's so many aspects of it, from design, creative, assembly, manufacturing, accounting, financing. I mean, it's a really complicated business. Well, what's interesting about that? So we have a parallel. I grew up in the commercial printing business. Yeah, that's where I spent 15 years. Same thing. Same Manu thing. Hardcore manufacturing, tons of processes that all rely on each other, you yeah. know, from getting the file to making the plates to bringing it out to the press to the, you know, post press and delivery distribution. And it's intense. Yeah. My father was an amazing operator. He still is. I mean, at one point we had, I think, over 6,000 employees working for him. So, wow. You know, we had a nursery. We had a medical yeah. division. No, that's, I mean, that's we big. like it was an extraordinary. Uh, manufacturing plant so it was it was fun i learned a lot from those days particularly you know now having almost a thousand people that work for the agency and you know over 100 employees and over five you know over 600 agents so what's the creation story behind the agency creation story behind the agency was really a, an idea to redefine real estate our opinion was that uh, the real estate brokerage firm was kind of getting broken and the brokerages were no longer giving services to their agents and they were really just becoming houses of uh, basically a real estate play you know rent 10,000 square feet put 100 desks in it pay $10,000 a month 
rent the desks for fifteen hundred dollars a month and make fifteen thousand dollars a month and my spread was five thousand dollars a month and I don't really need to give any services to the agents. I just need to make sure I make five thousand dollars a month or make a little bit off of each agent and uh let the agents run their own business. As I said, agents really became started to run their own business. And that was kind of a broken model because the reality is that, you know, as together you can do a lot more things than alone. And the problem with real estate agents is the majority of the real estate agents I would say 99%, which is why you see some extraordinary agents make extraord- do extraordinary things, because 99% of the real estate agents are really not good at their job, okay? And they're not good, they're not copywriters, they're not marketers, they don't understand business, they just do it kind of as a part-time basis. And so what we did as a brokerage firm is that we wanted to give create a brokerage firm all worked together, and the brokerage firm, the agency, gave tremendous knowledge, services, opportunities, skills, technology to the agents so that they can then use all of those things in order to then give you know great and tremendous service to their consumer, to the end consumer, right? So everybody wins. The agent wins. The consumer wins. Now, by doing that, the agent needs to understand that they're not going to be able to be on a 90-10 split or an 85-15 in order to stay open. You know, agents love an amazing marketing team. They love an amazing PR team. They love having knowledge of, you know, where the market's going, where in order to have all those people, you need to employ people and you need to have jobs. So if agents, you know, can understand that in order to for them to make more money because they have more resources at their hands that they all need to share in that and that we still operate at a small percentage and you're open about that. That's all about the art of collaboration. Then we all put together in order to create a better company so that we can get better services. And at the end of the day, if I can just sell more, it doesn't really matter what my split is. I'm going to take home a lot more money as an agent that versus having a high split and not getting a lot of volume, right? If I'm making a million dollars a year and my split's 80-20, I'm taking home 800000 And the reason I can make a million dollars is because consumers want to work with me because of all of the services that I give to them, yeah. right? That was the methodology behind the agency. So if I work at another company that's not giving me any services and I lose the listings and I'm only making $400,000 at a 90-10 split, Right, so now I'm making three hundred sixty thousand dollars. Well, do you rather make three hundred sixty thousand dollars, or do you rather make eight hundred thousand dollars? That's really the question. And so all of the agents got together, understood what we were doing, and we understood that in order to have those resources, that we actually had to pay for those resources. It's not that the agency's making a bunch more money; we're actually still operating on the same small, you know, five percent margins, uh, four to five percent margins. And, um, you know, if people are open about everything that they do and they share with their agents and they share with their employees, then everybody can work together and all boats, you know, all tides raise all boats, right? So it's all about, you know, all for one and one for all theory. And that really was the theory behind, you know, the agency. Well, that's awesome. And uh, this is where I think you were truly one of the first companies in this space to be disruptive because you created that culture and that belief and that sort of mind share within the agents, you did things di- differently, as you stated, day one. We did a lot of things differently. I mean, one of the things that we did differently is uh, the usage of technology. We decided day one that we were going to start the company with a one CRM system, one system that everybody was in using. And we have 100% participation in our CRM system. We bought a whole bunch of them. Unfortunately, none of them worked. And uh, we actually ended up having to build our own CRM system. So we actually have, I think we're the only company in the world that has its own proprietary CRM system. And I would guess that we're the only company in the world that has more than 50 agents that has 100% participation in their CRM system. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we built the system was because my CTO came up to us one day and I said to him, I was so frustrated. I said, you know, we can't get what we want out of the systems out there. I said, what can we do? And he said, well, you know, we can build our own system. And I said, you have the knowledge to do that? He goes, yeah. I go, well, how much is that going to cost me? He goes, I don't know, one hundred fifty dollars to $250,000. And I scratched my head. I didn't have that kind of money. I was so nervous. And I said, you know what? If we are going, you know, in order to be great, we have to dare to be bad. And that's what we've decided to do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go for it. Little did I know that $5 million later, yeah. I was going to still be building a damn CRM say, system. I was going to say, good luck yeah. with the one fifty. Yeah, <laughs> I know that. that but I know that back then. I'm not sure I would have made that decision. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's great, though, but it turned out okay, obviously. It turned out just fine. Still still turning. We'll see. 
So, so did you guys have, when you started, like in the beginning, I'm sure it was a struggle with any new business, right? Even though you had 15 years in with Hilton Highland, was there a moment in the agency in the beginning where you're like, this is it, we did it. We're over the hump. We're over that first hill. Like, this is legit. We're on our way. Was there? No, I don't think we're over the hump yet. I don't think we've crossed that, and I don't think we're legit yet. I mean, we still have a long way to go. We still have a whole bunch of things to do, and uh, we're not even close to being over the hump. So every day, it's still a startup. We're still, you know, busting our butts and, and doing everything we can. So absolutely not. I share that mindset wholeheartedly. You know, Diggs, our magazine, comes out every two weeks, right? I've always had this, what I say, healthy, unhealthy sort of saying that, hey, we're two weeks away from going out of business every two weeks. That's right. Regardless of what's happened in the past, it's game on every day. You're only as good as your last deal. Yeah. So it keeps us fired up and doing the right thing, right? Yep. So what was your biggest deal, personally? What's the biggest? Is the Playboy Mansion? I think that, uh, yeah, I think that was probably my largest deal was the Playboy Mansion. I, uh, certainly from a dollar perspective. Certainly one I can talk about. Um, <laughs> from a commission perspective, I've had some other deals, but, uh, you know, there's some extraordinary, the extraordinary deals. I mean, it's not only the ability to, you know, it's, it's who I also get to work with that makes it an, you know, an amazing deal. It's not only about the size of the money and, and the size of the commission, but obviously representing the Playboy Mansion, probably one of the most iconic homes in the planet, uh, was an extraordinary yeah. experience representing Michael Jackson, was an extraordinary experience, which I will never forget. I mean, I remember showing him some homes and he would walk in and and all of a sudden he had great acoustics and literally starts singing a cappella, which is just amazing. And it was just so extraordinary. I mean, I didn't, I, it was one of those people I hope never bought a home and I hope never leased a home because I just wanted to be around that man. Uh, the experience of, you know, Prince was an extraordinary experience. Yeah, he was one of those people that was just so into energy and so into uh, spirituality. And he literally, you know, would walk into a house. I would call it my client and I would say, I'm bringing Prince. And my client would get all excited and they would get the house ready. And I said, listen, please don't get excited. Please don't get dressed up. Please don't be there. Please treat it as anything else because literally he can walk up to the driveway not feel the energy, which has nothing to do with the house, and not come in the house. And you will do a whole bunch of things. And my clients would get so frustrated because he would literally do that all the time. And, you know, the women were always inside the house ready and primped up, and they just wanted to meet, you know, Prince. And I cannot tell you how many times he would not walk in the house. And I would say, please, 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 this is an extraordinary person. He would just not do it. He goes, I don't feel this energy. We got to go. And, of course, we were two hours late arriving to the house. Oh, yeah. You know, the client was sitting there waiting for us. I mean, the amount of upset clients I had with, you know, about that was extraordinary. So when you start working with this, <laughs> this level of clientele, you know, celebrities, athletes, people with notoriety, tell us about the approach. Like when they're first meeting you, like what kind of questions are they asking you? Like to, how, how are they vetting Mauricio? Well, again, I think you need to be extremely knowledgeable. You need to be charismatic. You need to be, you know, able to read the room, right? Uh, does somebody want to talk to you? Do they not want to talk to you? Do they want a lot of information? Do they want to roam the property by themselves? You know, what, what is it do they want? One of the tricks that I've always done as a real estate agent, I do everything possible to get in front of the client. And what I mean by that is I try to take the client in my house, in my car, okay? Because that's when I have the opportunity to talk about other stuff and get to know the client versus looking at the house. Because in the house, I believe that, as an agent, you should not give too much information as they're walking the house. You should be prepared to answer any question, but you should not be walking the house with the client and pointing mm -hmm. out, you know, hey, that's a fireplace with mm -hmm. Calcutta marble. Well, no shit, okay? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, we all know that's a fireplace, and we all know those are windows, and we all know that there's four walls in this room. I mean, so the problem with some agents is that they get in, they get excited about, you know, seeing a celebrity, they get in their face, they get over aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. But you do have to be able to read the room. I have a great story. The Emir of Qatar arrived. I had no idea who was arriving. They kept it super secret. I was showing a house literally as the arrival was an extraordinary parade of police officers. It was 16 motorcycles. It was 12 cars, six SUVs, Secret Service. I mean, it was amazing. And finally, like, the man gets out of the car. And I have no idea who the man is, right? And uh, so I'm sitting there. I'm showing the house. We're in the foyer. And I'm trying to, like, you know, the Secret Service are huge guys. They're all, you know, they're tower I'm 6'1", and they're towering over me. Um, and I can't even see. You know, I'm jumping up and down. I can't even see the Amir to talk to him. And uh, so I stop in the middle of my, you know, the first three, four minutes and I say, you know, sir, I, I, you know, at that point I kind of realized that, you know, it was Amir. I go, listen, 
do you like what you've seen so far? Is this a house that you'd like to see? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, listen, I really cannot show you the house with all of these, you know, secret service in the way. I just can't do my job. I go, do you think that we can ask them to wait outside? And he loved that. And so we did. We, uh, that aggressiveness and we asked them to wait, you know, by the door. They didn't go outside, but they certainly waited by the door. I had one guy following me. But, uh, again, it was that comfort and that confidence that allowed me to make a connection with this client, right? And um, so you need to have that confidence and you need to have, you need to be knowledgeable enough and have the confidence in yourself that you belong in that room and you need to be able to read that room. It sounds like, yeah, read the room is, it's awesome. So is there any, uh, uh, let's go back to this because this is really fascinating for, I'm sure, our audience who'd never in their wildest imaginations would ever be able to meet somebody or be in the same room or house with these, these types of people. So is there any one in particular sort of moment that you had that's maybe non real estate related where you got to chat about your childhood or you, you connected with one of these guys or, or like on a I different mean, there's level? Not one moment I connected with so many people. I just named, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, Amazing people that I had extraordinary experiences with, you know, Michael Jackson singing for me, the uh, Lady Gaga, you know, really fun, you know, experiences. I mean, it's just been an extraordinary life and extraordinary memoirs. I think we need another two hours for that podcast. Yeah, that's I think, a one, I think right? I'm going to have to have you on my podcast when I started yes, to have that one. I like it. I'm in. <laughs> Sign me up. So let's have some fun. You're married to actress Kyle Richards, who stars on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. How'd you guys meet? Kyle and I met at a bar, a nightclub called Bar One. It's now Bootsy Bellows. It's on the corner of Sunset and Doheny. It's still around. And uh, yeah, that's how we met. It can happen. So, guys. what was your line? Come on. Happen. Well, you got to show your line. I didn't even have a line. She actually just came up to me. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Let's verify that. Let's get that. Uh, I did not have a line. She did come up to me. She asked me some you know, question which I'm not going to repeat today, but she did ask me a question and um, I was unable to answer it, but I was like, oh my God, who is this beautiful woman? And then I ran around and I, you know, a mission accomplished. And then I saw her again at the same club, you know, like two nights later. And literally I asked her out for lunch and uh, we went to have lunch and she was engaged at the time. So, you know, unfortunately I broke off an engagement. Sorry, sir, if you're listening. <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> you do have an amazing voice. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we broke off. She broke off that engagement. And we literally, once we went to lunch, we were almost together every single day. And then we, uh, we were never apart pretty much since then. That's awesome. Looking for a personal stylist for your home? Check out Bow Concept. One of their design consultants can help you make the most out of your space. No request is too big or small for living, dining, sleeping, home office, and outdoor spaces. And check out their Southern California showrooms in Orange County and Costa Mesa and also in Los Angeles and La Brea. For more information, visit Bow Concept at bowconcept.com. Email info at bowconcept.la. So with your wife's show, the agency success, and all the celebrity clientele you deal with, like, Do you think being in the spotlight helps you or is it become more of a distraction? You always got to be on, you got to be showing up in these places and just in the, you you have to be. It's a little bit of both. uh, Being in the spotlight has certainly helped the uh, brand awareness for the agency being on, you know, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, being on million dollar listings with James and David Parnes were amazing guys and they represent us so extraordinarily well. Uh, certainly helps and the brand awareness is you know today is worldwide it's global because of those things I would never be able to do that on my own without you know that and um, so I think that it certainly comes with its sacrifices and its you know negative situations which is sometimes you can't just be real you just can't relax you want to be hanging out you know whatever at a beach and not be bothered and you know, let your tummy hang out and have a couple of beers and <laughs> you got to be on. Yeah. No, I, you, I, I you know, it. you got to be on all the time and you never know, you know, who's watching and what people are doing or what people are talking about. And you're under a microscope. I mean, you're definitely watched and, and everything that you do in life is analyzed and critiqued and, uh, analyzed again and critiqued again and sometimes you get some amazing love from people and that also feels good but sometimes you get some tremendous criticism and that doesn't feel so good you know a lot of people don't realize that 
all of us you know that are on television that we do put our lives out there and they don't realize that that social media that there is somebody behind that account and they're just so aggressive you know and so bullying on social media that uh, you know they just feel like they're talking to their phones and a computer and they don't realize that there's actually a real person reading that stuff and it's kind of sad to do that so you know it definitely comes with its problems and its sacrifices but all in all i i think it's been a good run so far cool so and what do you think of the show million dollar listing I think Million Dollar Listing is awesome. I think that uh, James and David are extraordinary. I think they make us look amazing. I think they're so much fun to watch. And uh, it's fun. I mean, it's, you know, the audience loves it. I, I get it all the time. I mean, I've certainly made my, plenty of my appearances on that show. I think, I think I'm probably one of the guys that's been on more reality television shows than anybody else, and I've yet to be paid for one. Bravo. Come on. Send me some Gosh, money. Come on. Uh, <laughs> royalty. Where's the royalty checks? So here's a fun fact. I bet you didn't know my wife and I were one of, on one of the first episodes of House Hunters in 1999. So, Mauricio, I was actually one of the first reality real estate uh, originators. I was one of the guys. Well, that's awesome. What were you doing on that? I, we were showed buying our first house, like that experience. Oh, cool. Where was the house? In Hollywood Riviera. Still living there today. Wow. And, yeah, yeah. Was that just part of the, uh, the hunting, or did you remodel the house? No, it was a quirky story. So, <laughs> my wife's sister was in real estate. And they called her office back when we were first looking for our first house. And they said, we're looking for a young couple. We're this production company buying their first house. And da 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 She's like, well, my, my sister and, you know, are there. So they just they bought a house. So we end up doing, I think it was episode number seven. So it was pretty funny. That's cool. Yeah. So and House Hunters is now. So you began that all for us. I, I, yes. So I, I, need, I need the <laughs> well, royalty check, too. thank you very too. much, Warren. I appreciate that. <laughs> I need the royalty check, too, Dan. <laughs> Tell us a funny, can't believe it happened, real estate story. Is there anything that's like you just that you a fireside beer talk? Like, can't believe this happened with this deal or this situation. I mean, there's stories every single day. I can't believe anything happens in real estate any, <laughs> every single day. The stories are extraordinary, and I hear them all the time. One of the things that always baffles me is the fake people, the fake buyers. Like that to me, I just don't understand. I mean, we had a, uh, a fake buyer that pretended that his father was the uh, king of monopoly, you know, the king and monopolized the tobacco industry in China, right? And so he arrived one day and the man smoked a lot of cigarettes, okay? <laughs> and he was clearly trying to, uh, to, to make sure that his father stayed in business. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he came and he showed up with a whole bunch of uh, papers and, you know, he had his real estate agent uh, who he got from Pasadena, which is very typical from Arcadia, actually, which is very typical from, from wealthy Chinese investors. And he called me up and he says, listen, you know, he's been sent by his father and he wants to buy three houses, one for himself, one for his sister, and one for his father. We need to buy them all in one community. We ran around like crazy. You know, he had, I said, have you verified this man? He goes, yeah, I have 100% verified this man. He's ready to go. I know him. I know the family. I know the whole thing. This is what the other real estate agent was telling me. So we ran around. We bought, we made, I worked from 8 a.m. to about 1.30 in the morning writing offers. We got all the offers accepted in one day. We bought $70 million worth of real estate. We bought three homes you know, in the, in the $25 million range. And then he, you know, it was one thirty in the morning. I was tired. I'm like, I need to go home. He goes, no, now let's go celebrate. And I go, I'm not going to go celebrate with you. I said, I need to go home. I'm tired. Uh, I go, we'll celebrate. You know, it was a three-day escrow. He was wiring the money. I go, we'll celebrate in three days. I'll take you out. You know, but I'm exhausted. So I went home, told my wife what I was doing. You know, she's like, until now you were selling houses? I go, yeah, it's crazy. I go, I really hope, you know, it materializes. We'll see what happens. Well, you know, somewhere around five in the morning, I get a phone call. The phone's ringing, the phone's ringing, the phone's ringing. It's the other real estate agent. I go, what's up, man? He goes, oh, we've been out all night. We went to the casino. We lost a whole bunch of money. He asked me to borrow $10,000, and now he's asking if he can borrow money from you. I go, dude, fuck off. Okay, bleep that. I go, fuck off. I go, I'm sleeping. It's four in the morning. It's five in the morning. I hung up the phone on him. You know, I wake up the next day, 10, 11 o'clock. He's nowhere to be found. 12 o'clock, he's nowhere to be found. All of a sudden, I get a call from the real estate agent. He goes, bro, I don't know what to do. He goes, I've been taken. He goes, the guy took me for $15,000. He doesn't show up. He's absolutely, you know, gone. He was a complete fake. And I'm like, man, I feel so bad for you. And of course, I had to call, you know, all the people that, you know, we sold the house for and let them know. But nobody hurt as much as that guy 
losing fifteen thousand wow. dollars. So that's crazy. So what's the I motivation? I hope that doesn't tell all you crazy people to start playing that scam. Well, so <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's unfortunate. So, but at at that level, when you're dealing with you know these huge mega twenty plus million dollar listings. How do you qualify these buyers? Are they like are you financially qualified? You it's say, hey. hard. We usually do. We we're usually really good at financially qualifying people. The problem is that there's always that one deal where you weren't 100 percent sure that the person could qualify, and sure enough, you know, you mission accomplished and deal closed, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm you know closing a pretty large transaction right now, and that uh, you know above 30 million dollars that uh, the buyer's never seen the house, and so uh, you know you're scratch your head you're like how can somebody spend 30 million dollars i've never seen the house well it's happened and uh, so again sometimes you just scratch your head and you got to take a little bit of risks and you know the, if you don't take any risks and you don't you know look at it sometimes you miss out on a deal and it's that one deal that always makes you you know wonder if you if you missed that we're pretty good at qualifying i mean generally speaking i would say we're able to qualify 99% of the people that we work with at that level, but there's always that 1% that we can't qualify. And out of that 1%, there's a handful that can buy it and do qualify. And there's a bunch of them that don't. <laughs> yep. Makes sense. So let's talk about marketing for a bit. That's my favorite subject, of course. Um, what's your approach to marketing a $40 million listing? And how does that differ from a $15 million listing? Or is there a difference? There really is no difference whatsoever in terms of the approach to marketing the property. It's the property has to be marketed for what it is, and uh, yeah, you know, there's is if it's a piece of land, it's an innate. Like if you try to change, if you try to change the architecture of a property and make it what it should not be, then you can't do it. So you know what you need to understand is you need to, as Michelangelo said, he would look at the rock, right, and he would say the sculpture was already in the rock, right, and all he did was chisel away pieces in order for the you know the sculpture to show up. And if you analyze marketing from that perspective and you analyze what you're dealing with, then you're going to make a plan based on what it is that you're handling, right? So if you're handling an equestrian site and you can target market equestrian people, uh, it might not be that, it might be a $100 million estate, but it may not be as expensive as marketing the Playboy Mansion, for example, because the audience for that equestrian site is going to be a lot smaller than the audience that might be, you, you might need to reach the buyer for the Playboy Mansion. So you, you need to understand what it is that you're marketing, and you just need to be able to, to, uh, to market for that. You know, one of the things that differentiates, in my opinion, a real estate company from another real estate company is the marketing, right? And so the, our approach at the agency in terms of marketing is that we market every property as if it was a 20 or $30 million mm-hmm. state, right? So if it's a $2 million property, it's the same photography as a $20 million property. It's the same photographer. It's the same copywriter. It's the same care it's every everything's the same and that's what differentiates the companies right so you can't look at differentiating the estate you have to look at differentiating the companies tell me about the agency like the word the brand what does it mean did you come up is it literally mean the like an agency for real estate yeah it literally does mean that you know um one of the things that i did not like about working at hilton and highland is that every time i spent money on advertising i felt like i was advertising the owners of Hilton and Highland, Mr. Hilton and Mr. Highland, and I was spending all the money. So as an agent, I wanted to create a company where agents, you know, something that was the best company for me, right? Mm -hmm. A top top producing agent in the country, right? And so one of the things that I wanted to do is that when somebody's spending money, I wanted it to be just so generic and I wanted it to be such an extraordinary thing. And one day I'm sitting in the shower. That's where I do all my thinking, by the way, is a shower. I can take really long showers. Best songs written Um, in the shower, everything in the shower. (laughs) So one day I was in the shower and literally I'm like, God, what can I do that is just generic? What can I do that is just generic? And all of a sudden the agency and I'm like, holy shit, the agency, like there's no way it's around. And then it's got so many really cool connotations. Obviously the CIA, we're in Hollywood. So the agency from Hollywood perspective, and then obviously, you know what we do, right? And I'm like, there's no way that that's available. I ran out of the shower. I was wet. I went to the computer. I started Googling. I'm like the agency, nothing. The agency realized nothing, nothing, nothing's coming up. I'm like, this is not possible. There's no way that this name's available. And uh, here we are. <laughs> Boom. It was brilliant. A brilliant name. And sometimes it just starts with a, with a name. I'm, I, I'm a believer of that. Like that gives it its sort of, its soul, right? 100%. You know what I mean? Like that's for us, Diggs. You know, that took me a long time. I to love that name, Diggs. Well, thanks. So it, like, cool. And everyone, that's every, the biggest accolades we've ever gotten is, I love your name, love the name of the yeah. you know, And it's like, it all starts there. That's the seed, right? 
So if you could define what makes you successful in three words, three words only, what would they be? Honest, competitive, knowledgeable. Nice. Marketing again. Question. Forgot to ask you this. Playboy Mansion. Yep. How the hell do you come up with a CMA? I know you don't come up with a CMA for, for that, but like, I'm just so curious, like, okay, we're talking price. Where does that, how does that even begin? Like, I think it's worth, it's based on this. I mean, of course you got the traditional neighborhood, the this, the square foot, you know, but like when you get to that hundred million dollar level, how the hell, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that conversation on picking that price. How does that work? Yeah, it's impossible. The only way you can do that is by experience. And that's why only a few people can actually you know, handle that listing. And when you get to the certain levels, you can, it's, it's all done by experience because you've sold, you know, multiple properties at that level. You understand what buyers are looking for. You understand what buyers are willing to pay. And, uh, it's really not a CMA. It's more based on just experience. Yeah. Knowledge is everything. Knowledge. Right? Yeah. That's a really profound point, especially. And I think the, the market knows this. That's why the majority, the 80, 20 rules, the guys doing the 20%, like you are, it's more like the 10%. They're doing 90% of all those super high end deals because the market knows that. It demands that. It's, it's the way it, it has to be, right? 100%. And, you know, one of the things that happens is that uh, I always say if you want to get something done, give it to the busiest person in the room because the person that's just not busy, just for some weird reason, just ends up doing nothing all day long. They figure they can get to their task later. And that later comes and later comes. And all of a sudden, they never get to their task where the people, you know, the busiest people in the room get everything done just because they have to get everything done. Yep. So let, let's talk about the market real quick. Um, give us some insights and in Intel. It's 2009. We're typically sort of at or near the end of the typical real estate cycle, right? We're going back to 2009 or 2019. Did I, I said 19, right? No, you said nine. <laughs> the hell is wrong with, with the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the interview? Er. At least I'm paying attention, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that was the start of this. That was actually the end of the last cycle. Yeah, actually. that's why I was curious to so, know okay, where you so were I, actually heading with that one. I was actually I was ahead of myself. So, no, so we've been about nine, ten years, right? So typically, you know, we're entering or at the end or beginning of another cycle. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think we've already been in a uh, bit of a slowdown. I mean, if you look at New York, New York's been at a definite slowdown. I think they're almost ready to be start coming back up. I think one of the things that's happened if, uh, in California, particularly Los Angeles, which is quite interesting despite our high tax rates, property tax rates, is that everybody still wants to live in California. And it's really become a really, LA has become, in my opinion, today's trendiest city in the world. And what I mean by that, I mean, people want to live here. There's a tremendous shortage of housing. There is uh, wealth is, is flocking mm-hmm. here. Uh, the amount of billionaires that we're selling homes to is extraordinary, whether they're buying their primary residence or their 20th home. Uh, it's extraordinary, and it's become the cool place to be. And I personally think that L.A. might just skip this cycle. We're already seeing and have seen a slowdown in terms of pricing. That has stopped. The appreciation of pricing has 100% stopped. I mean, it's pretty much flatlined. We're not seeing any more appreciation, but we are seeing that any seller that wants to sell their property at flatline level, you know, plus or minus 1% to 2% of 2018 or 2017, 2018 pricing, the property is selling. And so the only thing that's not selling is, is properties that are being overpriced today or properties or sellers that are looking for some sort of appreciation based on, you know, 2018 pricing. What about development? Because there's been some crazy development in the last two, three, four, five years with, you know, what, with the, what, what's the one spec home that's now, was it 250, 250 million or is it, is it dropped or was? Yeah, that was a uh, Bel Air Road. Bruce Mikowski's prepared that spec home. Beautiful house. It's actually extraordinary. I think, again, you know, uh, it's now dropped. I think it's now at 150 million dollars. I'm not 100 percent sure. And um, but um, yeah, the, I think one of the biggest mistakes that developers made, and the reason you're seeing some of these homes is that they just got overzealous and a little bit greedy on their pricing. And uh, the homes are extraordinary. I mean, you know, one of the things that this development has done is super exciting because it has created probably some of the best homes we have ever seen in history. Raise the bar. I would raise the bar. I mean, you'd have to go back to the Renaissance times, you know, when the French and the British were 
building extraordinary castles that changed the world. And I think that's one of the things that's happening right now. Architects are getting to do extraordinary things. Developers are doing extraordinary things. And so one of the great things that's coming out of that is that we're seeing extraordinary properties and extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, we're really lucky to be living in that time today totally agree. to see what we're seeing. The amenities that we're seeing are amazing. And they're taking more risks because there's like, it's gotten wider. It's not just, you know, this style, that style. It's like, Let's create our own style. It's a hybrid, you know, glass houses and this and that. It's, it's, it's wide fun. and it's amazing and people are doing extraordinary things. And so we're lucky to live in that. And I'm lucky to be able to sell some of those Sell homes. them. And, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Someone who was building a $500 million estate. On, is that still going? It's still under construction. They've had a little bit of a hard time finishing it. It's taken a long, long time to finish it. They've been building it for a little bit long. I certainly hope they didn't miss the market. The property is extraordinary. It's humongous. I think it's 110,000 square feet or something like that. I mean, I can't imagine. It's like a Vegas hotel, like. right? It's you like know? a boutique hotel in Vegas. <laughs> Why don't we just get a permit for gambling and we can make that the next, you know? The next casino. Seriously. Yeah. I'd I love to go there. I don't think the residents on Stradella would like that, though. No I don't traffic. think they would like that. The top that. of the hill would yeah. be kind of bad. But It's a... Uh, We'll see what happens. I hope so, he finishes. I'd love to see it. Are you going to get the listing? Finished. I don't know if I'll get the listing. I mean, I'm currently on, not working Mauricio? with him and uh, <laughs> that developer. And I'm currently not working with him. That doesn't mean I will or will not in the future. But um, I know him. He's a great developer. He's a good guy. He's a good friend of mine. And I, I really hope he finishes the product. And whether or not I get the listing, I hope I sell it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, let's, what about that billion-dollar land listing? That's a joke. That's a complete joke. They've made that, that. That's just one of those things that people just make mistakes on, and that's the stuff that that's the stuff that I talk about all the time. Where it's just over greed, mistakes, and that just causes all these things to be stale and for people not to look at them seriously. And it's just a mistake on the agent's part. It's a mistake on the seller's part. It's just a mistake all the way around. And um, it's sad to me to watch those mistakes, and it's sad to me to. to you know, the agents do it, you know, with the intention of hoping just to get some uh, press and to get, you know, use that as a business card. But the reality is that they're not doing their, their clients any favors by accepting that product and that sales. Let's talk about the real estate industry for a moment. The industry consolidation has been crazy, you know, and it's getting a little crazier. What are your thoughts on this whole, you know, there's three questions within one question. The, the consolidation, you know, i.e. the compasses of the world who are now private equity backed, got lots of money, and, you know, clearly you're on a path for an IPO. And you've got the discounters, Purple Bricks, Redfin. So the industry's changed quite a bit since you started the agency. Tell us about your thoughts on, on that. I think there's room and space for everybody. Uh, there's nobody that anybody will have a monopoly on any of this thing because there's 33 flavors in an ice cream shop. And the last time I saw, nobody bought one flavor only. So uh, there's always choices. Uh, I think that what Compass has done is extraordinary. You know, being backed by so much money and the ability to raise all that money is really mind-boggling. I just don't understand how you know you can do that for a real estate company. And their you know, pace of growth in order to get to where they're at today has been extraordinary. I'm certainly not a fan of their methodology in terms of recruiting, but uh, that's you know, a different conversation. But what they have done as a company and uh, been able to do that is, is fantastic. I'm not 100% sure that they are uh, deliver on their promises. Um, I certainly have heard a lot of agents you know, that have worked for them tell me that uh, they have extraordinary promises, but they don't necessarily deliver on their promises. What ended up happening to them, who knows? And, you know, I wish them the best of luck and will still yet to be seen. Uh, one of the things that, you know, Compass is uh, consolidation and buying and what they've done is, you know, you can look at things in, a, in, a, in, a, in very different ways. And I see that as a tremendous opportunity for the agency. I see that as, uh, as a field to run. And I'm just so excited personally that they are doing what they are doing because with all of their money, they're opening up the path for us to be who we are without having to spend any of it. And, uh, you know, literally we started the company with a million dollars and uh, we've yet, we have zero debt and we've yet to take on any other money. And so, uh, you know, we've been able to grow this company grassroots all, you know, good old American style and what, mm -hmm. you know, what it's really all about. We've put back every cent. We really haven't taken any money out. So it's not like I've gotten rich. I've just put it right back into the company and, you know, let the company grow and risked it all. I mean, I've got everything at risk in that company. 
And, uh, but the excitement for, uh, to see the, the, the paths open up and the opportunities that Compass is creating for somebody like us. And, you know, when you look at the, uh, the uh, industry as a whole, and you think to yourself, well, who's going to be the next, you know, who's, who's going to be able to compete with Sotheby's on a national, with, with uh, Compass on a national basis? And when you see Sotheby's and Coldwell Banker and some of these, uh, you know, NRT and, you know, how they're shrinking, I mean, their stock has just yeah. shrank tremendously, and I just don't see their end. They're a big, huge Titanic, and I just don't know how they move it and change it. I hope they do, because I am a fan of, of, of and I do believe in competing companies. But I'm not sure that we see growth in that company today. And I, I, I think that, you know, the agency is the only other company that I know of today that is positioned to be the boutique brand, you know, next to Compass being, you know, kind of the next Walmart. You know, let, let Compass be the Walmart of the industry and let us be the Barneys of the industry. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, we're both in the same industry. We're both competitors, but we're really not competing for the same client. Right. And so I think that the opportunities for the agency, given that, are just extraordinary. And I'm super happy. I'm up for the task. Like I said to you earlier, when you asked me the question, when we, you know, when did we get to the uh, point where we saw that we felt that we made it? And that's why I'm saying we have yet to make it because the, uh, you're either going to make it or you're not going to make it. And those opportunities, we're either going to make right decisions and we're going to do amazing, extraordinary things. And we will be an extraordinary company nationally and globally. Uh, or we won't. And uh, right now is the time that we will uh, that those decisions will be made, and we're making steps to be that company. And we're super excited for our growth. But uh, so I hope that answers your question. But I see Compass as a uh, paving the way for uh, for an opportunity for us to grow, and and I'm thrilled to see it happen. Cool. Is there an end game for the agency? Like, are you ever going to be on the block or is it all like you're going to fight it out until you're... My uh, dream at this point is to build a company that, uh, you know, I I almost, I hate to say this and we're so far away, but I guess, I mean, I got, I got to at least say it, but if I could build a company similar to what Richard Branson did and build a brand and be the Richard Branson of Virgin, like that would be my dream. Right. And if I can build the agency to be a worldwide, global, national brand that is well known and uh, that 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 would be my dream. So my dream is not to sell. My dream is not to cash out. My dream is to do something that uh, will be read about in textbooks that, uh, you know, how did how did this company grow from a million dollars to whatever it becomes? And to be, you know, the guy that uh, has the opportunity to be behind that, that that's my dream. So uh, I'm not on the selling block. I'm not looking to sell. I'm not looking to cash out. I'm far from that. I'm looking at, uh, I'm still 48 years old. I've got, you know, a lot of drive left in me today. And uh, I'm super excited for the future of this thing. Very cool. Well, we heard it here first, right? You heard it here first. <laughs> awesome. I buyers. Blockchain. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I. You know, I, I. I'm not. You know, I'm not convinced that that's something that's going to take off. I think that's something to be part of our our industry. You will see it. You will see it happen. It will be part of our industry. Uh, I don't think it'll affect companies like the agencies when you have you know really different extraordinary properties that cannot be just bought online. You know, on a planned urban development where you're literally picking. A floor plan, there's five floor plans to pick from and there's 2,000 homes. I can certainly see that, you know, happening and, and eventually. There's a lot of risks that I can see come involved with that from both a uh, developer's perspective and, you know, an agent's perspective. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what type of lawsuits, you know, come up with that and what kind of risk and litigation comes up with that type of thing and, you know, how deep that can really go. But uh, I definitely don't see that as a competitive situation to the pathway we're taking at the agency, not today anyway, certainly not over the next 10 years, not in the next 10 years and not, you know, in the next 15 years. I mean, where it goes after that, I have no idea. Yeah. I, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't see it uh, hitting our markets today. Do you think Zillow is going to become a brokerage? Well, they're already a brokerage, but like... They're already a brokerage. They'll definitely, you know, they, they keep claiming they're not, but they're doing it. You know, they are, they talk out of their, you know, two sides of their mouths. They're, you know, I, again... Another company that I just love to see them just be honest, you know, with the uh, with the people in terms of what they do, you know, just be honest about what you do. You're an extraordinary company. You've done extraordinary things. Be honest. Be you know, be upfront. Don't talk out of both sides of your mouth. You know, Compass does that. Um, you know, Purple Breaks. You know, you asked me about Purple Breaks and, and the discount broker. Obviously, we've seen from you know, Purple Breaks has really had hit some really tough times right in the near uh, recently. 
and um, you don't see that really happening. I, you know, I, like I said, if you want to hire a plumber to sell the most important site, you know, the biggest financial. Life, yeah. I mean, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, somebody that's you know willing to work for that kind of money is just does not not somebody that has any knowledge and is not going to protect you. So if you want to do that, go for it. But uh, that has not been successful. The Redfin model, I still don't understand. You know, the real discount thing there. I mean, I I'm selling a house right now with a Redfin agent representing the buyer and that Redfin agent is earning the same exact commission I am. So I'm not 100% sure I understand. So where, where's the discount model? Where yeah. the discount model is on that. But uh, we'll see We'll see where that goes. Well, I, <laughs> Warren Buffett has a phenomenal quote and it's price is what you pay, value is what you get. I love that. I'm going to borrow that from Warren you Buffett. You got it. You got it. Um, but it's counterintuitive. I think all this technology in a weird way is helping insulate what you do and the agency does in the sense that, you know, discounts at the higher level, it's all about the network. It's all about if I hire Mauricio and the agency, okay, for my $50 million property, it's who you know and who you're network with and what you do and what you bring based on just your whole sphere. Is that You know what I mean? Oh, without there's question. A value to I that. mean, there's, there's a tremendous value that you cannot replace with technology. I mean, the days we all start socializing with robots, I guess you can do that, but that would not be a lot of fun, would it? No. I mean, shoot me now. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> no, this is, yeah. All right, closing thoughts. What are two pieces of advice you would give yourself, you give your younger self, rather? I think I do it. You know, follow your dreams and have certainty in your decisions and take risks and go for it. What could you tell our audience two things or something, could be anything, one thing, that they would be surprised to know about you? Like, I didn't know Mauricio did was a fan of this or did that or is there anything that that would be surprising i mean my life is so much out there that it's kind of hard to think of something that people don't you know that i that i'm going to shock somebody on <laughs> that's why we're trying to get a uh, exclusive here Marisa. yeah i don't know i could give you an exclusive <laughs> warren i'd have to go you know read all my diaries that i didn't keep and uh <laughs> You know, like I said to you, my memory is not that, uh, you know, great, you know, from as a kid. And I really do have a, uh, a short-term memory. I don't keep a lot of things. I'm not, uh, I don't have that elephant brain that, you know, remembers all those things. I kind of just let things roll off on my sleeve. So uh, I can't go back into time and give you any sort of insight on that. But uh, I'm a pretty simple man. You know, despite, you know, what people might think, I would think I, I'm, I'm an extraordinarily simple man. The way I think of everything is simple. The, my solutions are simple. The simpler things get, I can understand it. And that's how I uh, treat business is keep things simple. And that's how I treat my family. And that's how I treat my life is keeping things simple. That's great. Do you read a lot of books? Are you, are you like, are you a fan of the Bransons of the world? And are you like, do you yeah, read that kind of stuff? I, yeah, I read well, plenty of books. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't have enough time to read as much as my father reads, but I certainly uh, keep, uh, keep some good education going for sure. Well, it totally ties into your story. Like it seems like everyone in every, not everyone, people that, that are high achievers in whatever industry they are, they are, they're all empowered. They're all powered by something, some moment, something that happened in their childhood with you is your health. You were in, you know, that, they all have this torch that, that was given to them. There's a common thread. 100%. If you look at these, you know, and it's, it's crazy. And even the, the, this is called the Titans of Real Estate. And we're interviewing people that are Titans. There's a drive for success that drives everybody. And people have different drives that drive them, right? And that's a personality trait. And there's some good personality traits and some great drives. And there's some bad personality traits yeah. and really negative drives, right? You know, uh, competitiveness will use me, I think, as a good trait and a good driver. Greed is a negative driver. For sure. Right? Still, still makes you want to be successful, but just in a negative fashion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's well said. Lakers or Clippers? Lakers. Yes. <laughs> God, that's a separate podcast. I grew LA. up in L.A., man. LA, man. I mean, uh, you know, Magic, James Worthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I can name nice. them all. Coop. I mean, uh, Showtime, baby. So Dodgers or Angels? Dodgers. Dodgers. Uh, nice. This is a weird one, but I'm going to, because your main office is in Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills or Malibu? That is a tough one. They're it's, completely Encino? different, man. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to pick one or the other. Sorry. <laughs> Both. <laughs> so I asked Santiago this when we did a podcast. And I'm like, you guys should bet you, Santiago, and, and uh, Billy, who sells the most, like a dollar gentleman's bet. 
Do you guys have any like gentlemen's bets? No, we don't. And I wouldn't want to have that. I mean, I <laughs> look at this point in my life. I wish uh, I want. Santiago to crush it, man. I I told him, I he you know he's the Bolivian bull. He's an animal. He's an extraordinary man. He's an amazing salesperson. Uh, he's just one of the most ethical people in the world. And uh, I'd love to see him break all my records and to you know have a consistency that I've had and have that life and just destroy me and leave me in the dust. I'm ready for that, and I just love to watch that. So I I don't want to bet against myself. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm teasing. But <laughs> well, it goes back to what you built at the agency, like culturally you got they're all like-minded and you guys are all marching at the same sort of drum and it's it's beautiful to see it's like a perfectly balanced sports team thank you all knowing the, their roles and all doing it it's all all in all for one one for all rising tide lifts all boats we obviously make errors every once in a while but you guys are doing the right <laughs> thing and uh I, I wish you continued success keep fighting the good fight and onward and upward we go warren thank you so much for the uh for this opportunity and i look forward to listening to the podcast good stuff and that wraps up this episode thank you for tuning in and we hope you found some value please share subscribe and leave a review find us on itunes and your favorite podcast provider Until next time.